I want to talk about Aquaman. Aquaman is a 2018 movie directed by James Wan. Based on the character from DC Comics, it tells the story of Arthur Curry, the Aquaman, a half-human, half-Atlantean who previously helped defeat the new god Steppenwolf with the Justice League a year earlier. He's summoned by the Princess Mira of the underwater kingdom of Zebel to convince Arthur to find the mystical trident of Atlan and take his rightful place as King of Atlantis in order to stop his half-brother Orm, the current King of Atlantis, from gathering the forces of the seven underwater kingdoms to become the Ocean Master and wage an all-out war on the surface world. When Zack Snyder cast Jason Momoa as Arthur Curry slash Aquaman for Justice League, a good chunk of individuals were surprised while another chunk had a feeling that this was to be expected. <laughs> Those of us who grew up with either Peter David's 1990s run of the Aquaman comic book that revealed him as this long-haired, rugged, shirtless Atlantean with a harpoon for a left hand, or his appearances in Bruce Timm's DC Animated Universe shows in which he sported the same look, immediately realized with the first promo shot of Momoa as Aquaman that this was the main inspiration for the character. What shocked a lot of people when news came out of his casting, however, is that in regards to Zack's vision for the main films he would make in the DC Extended Universe, Momoa was pretty much his main choice. Which, considering how Aquaman is usually depicted, not just in comics, but in both live action and animated television as well, once again, surprised a lot of individuals that you'd expect to be surprised. Now, for those of you who are new to the channel, my stance when it comes to race swap characters, I feel, is very fair. A non-white performer should be free to play a character that is either traditionally or conceived to be white if there is nothing established about that character to justify why they need to be white. This is the reason why when racists try to argue the reverse when it comes to traditionally black and brown characters cast <laughs> as white people, it never really sticks. The majority of said black and brown characters in comics have their ethnicity and culture embedded in them from the get-go. Now, I don't say this to say that everyone who was surprised with Momoa's casting or initially disliked Momoa's casting was on the same comics gate level racism. They definitely existed and made a fuss, mind you, but there was a good chunk of people I knew both personally and offhand that just didn't vibe with the long-haired, rugged, hook-for-a-hand look that Snyder was inspired by simply because the 90s was very hit-and-miss time for edginess at both DC and Marvel that not everyone gelled with. But, as you can imagine, just like other individuals who had valid and legit criticisms for other characters and their performers that portrayed them, their voices got swallowed up by the very loud minority of bigoted individuals. In the case of Momoa's Aquaman, it was the same individuals who see any non-white performer portray a character that was created to be and is usually portrayed as white. The same ones that complain even if the character's race was ambiguously hinted at so that anyone of any ethnicity could play them. Even if the hinting of their race wasn't subtle at all. And even if the creator of the story themselves handpicked a person of color to play a character that fans have personally conceived as white for the longest time. According to Momoa, he was shocked as well. In an interview he had with SAMDB News during his press junket for Justice League, he said, and I quote, All I could think of was the traditional Aquaman from the comics, who is white and blonde and wears the orange and green costume. I thought he had to be joking, but Zack had this look on his face. He said, hear me out, and told me that he wanted the Aquaman in his film to be an outsider along the lines of Clint Eastwood's character, the outlaw Josie Wales. Now, just take a minute to digest the early part of that quote, readers. All that Momoa could think of, that he could picture, 
was the traditional Aquaman, white and blonde. Why is that? While Aquaman is definitely one of those niche characters, despite him being a founding member of the Justice League, why is it that a lot of us are so quick to permanently associate not only Aquaman, but also a handful of other superheroes across both DC and Marvel with aspects of whiteness? Well, it's because the creator of the character made them white, you might answer. But have you ever asked yourself why? they made them white in the first place. Because I have, thanks to the success of Jason Momoa's Hawaiian portrayal of this traditionally white character. And I have no problem being the one to tell you that because of how the source material was handled as well as the intention that was brought to it, the DCEU version of not just Aquaman, but also Atlantis and his secondary characters might be the best version we ever receive in a long time. And that's not a dig at whatever James Gunn's plans are for Aquaman and the rest of Atlantis when he eventually covers them in this revamped DC universe he's making, but seeing what 2018's Aquaman has done with the character makes me want to explore how we got here in the first place. That involves exploring the possible reasoning why whiteness was the cornerstone of a lot of both DC and Marvel superheroes, attempts that were made to establish justification for Aquaman's whiteness in the past, and how shifting things around in regards to trademark characteristics for certain individuals actually helped the storytelling in the 2018 movie that did a better job in the justification department than the attempt that was made in the comics. Aquaman was created by Austrian Jewish American writer Mort Weisinger in 1941, with this image and iconic orange and green outfit designed by American artist Paul Norris. Why do I highlight that Aquaman's co creator was Jewish? Because Jewish American men, specifically first and second generation Jewish American men, made up the majority of the creatives within the comic book industry's superhero genre during its golden and silver age, both at the companies that would eventually become DC and Marvel Comics. And the majority of them, in one way or another, were all prone to Americanization. Now, I go more in depth regarding this phenomenon in my video essay about the movie Get Out and its connection with Invasion of the Body Snatchers, but Americanization, as then President Theodore Roosevelt liked to call it, was the concept of immigrants sacrificing their own individual cultures and heritage for the sake of becoming American, like those of the colonizers who stole this land from the Native Americans. The thing about Americanization, however, is that its precursor, and the very foundation it was built on, is the concept of whiteness, which was created as a way for the dominant socioeconomic ethnic group to establish an us versus them mentality between working class European Americans and the freed African Americans of Virginia and Maryland in the 1600s that soon spread across the country. You know, so that we didn't appropriately unite against said ethnic group that rules the nation a la Act 3 of A Bug's Life. The thing about Americanization, however, and the concept of whiteness as a result, is that once you sacrifice your culture and heritage for the sake of becoming American, aka white, you end up participating in the social control and subjugation of the individuals who live in this country and fail the paper bag test, both intentionally and unintentionally. And for a lot of immigrants, the permission to partake in Americanization wasn't first given to a lot of minorities until it benefited the ethnic group that rules the nation in the us versus them numbers game, the Irish the Italians, and the Polish were among some of the people that weren't allowed to claim whiteness until the bourgeoisie needed them in their ranks. It also makes one feel bad about their own ethnicity, heritage, culture, and upbringing when engaging with others who are considered meeting the ideal standards of what it means to be a successful American, especially if you're a black or brown person in this country. It makes citizens that can't culturally claim this evolved version of whiteness feel ashamed for being Asian, 
makes its black citizens feel bad about the state of their natural hair or that they weren't born with skin and eyes as light as Michael Ely to get as close as possible. It causes them to develop a sense of self-hatred, internalize racism, or actively seek out ways to come close to knowing what whiteness feels like by trying to be one of the good ones, a credit to your people, or a model minority. In the case of the creatives of Marvel and DC, most making up of first and second generation Jewish American males upon the transition from the Great Depression to World War II, they were not immune from experiencing the various pressures of their white peers. The way society promoted the traits regularly associated with the ideal model American as opposed to their own, or the promise of success that the American dream offered them, despite it usually being exclusive to those who fit said model American in comparison to their own Jewish lineages, heritages, and cultures their families brought to the country with them. And said pressures and promises helped in their desire to either be in that number or fantasize about what it would be like to have what said white model American had in their various attempts of turning in what was left of their heritage for the sake of Americanization. Dwayne McDuffie put it best, comic books is an industry made up of people who desperately want to be accepted, so they desperately want to be like mainstream America. They imprint themselves on heroic images that embody all the stuff that they wish that they were, rich and handsome and muscular and able to handle any situation. This is a possible reason why most comic book creators that we know of that became the pillars of the likes of Marvel and DC are, for the largest part, mostly white, despite being created by Jewish men. This is who they aspire to be who they want to look like, who they want to emulate, thanks to the concept of Americanization, aka Whiteness 2.0, making them envious of the looks and success usually associated with it that thanks to their native cultures, backgrounds, genetics, and upbringing, they can never completely reach. This reasoning has roots in a few of the most notable Jewish names in American superhero comic book history, both in Marvel and in DC. A couple of the easily accessible examples that come to mind are rather tame in comparison to others that can be considered more drastic, only dipping their toes in the water of his Americanization in order to still claim their individual Jewish culture, upbringing, and heritage, as opposed to making a full-fledged cannonball. Romanian Jewish American and Marvel legend Stanley Lieber stuck with the pen name of Stan Lee so that the use of his Jewish name could be attached to his great American novel that he never got a chance to write. And in an interview he had with comic book editor, publisher, and critic Gary Groth in 1990, Austrian Jewish American and celebrated superhero artist Jacob Kurtzberg revealed that while still initially proud of his Jewish heritage over the course of his life, he settled on Jack Kirby being his pen name when he became an artist because he, and I quote, wanted to be an American. Even though being born in Manhattan in 1917 made him an American by default, while a mild one, this being part of the reason why he didn't want to use Kurtzberg speaks volumes. As I've stated before, establishing pen names and eventually changing their real names to their pen names are pretty much the most either Lee or Kirby did in regards to drinking the Americanization Kool-Aid. Two of their most successful <laughs> collaborations during their time at Marvel Comics, Captain America himself, Steve Rogers, and Fantastic Four's Ben Grimm, aka The Thing, were both homages to their Jewish heritage and culture. While The Thing wouldn't officially be confirmed to be Jewish in the main 616 comic universe, until Fantastic Four issue 56 in the story Remembrance of Things Past, written by Carl Kessel and published summer of 2002 as a tribute to Kirby himself, both characters were heavily inspired by the protector golem of Jewish folklore. Yes, 
I also know that also has roots in Superman's origin. I already know. <laughs> And while this is completely speculation, one of the possible reasons why Lee and Kirby didn't make Grimm Jewish right from jump when they had creative control of the character is because there was an unspoken taboo among superhero comics back then not to associate these characters with real world religions. I say it's speculation because while there are references to said taboo across the internet, there's no official source for it. But this is probably why, while existing since the mid-60s, Stan Lee and Bill Everett's Daredevil didn't officially become the poster boy of comic book Catholicism until the mid-80s, when Frank Miller wrote for him in the famous story, Born Again. But to get back on topic, if these easily accessible examples of Jewish American creatives in the superhero genre of the comic book industry utilizing Americanization are the most mild, then one of the most drastic ones, while still being well known, has to be one half of Batman's creation team, Bob Kane, who has gone on record confirming that the creation of Bruce Wayne slash Batman was a form of wish fulfillment, on par with how Dwayne McDuffie described their, and I quote, want to be like mainstream America. I wanted to be Bruce Wayne in my reverie and uh -huh. in my daydreams. I felt uh, instead of a poor kid, I imagined I'd like to be a rich, a rich playboy and, and fight crime at night because I hate all injustices in the world. Would it have been and possible to have made a, a Jewish superhero or was that out of the question at the time? <laughs> Well, uh, only only for the Jewish Forward, which is a newspaper of the Bronx. <laughs> but that's the only paper that would take a Jewish hero. According to writer and historian Gerard Jones, he was born Bob Kahn and went for the Bob Kane name very early. Everyone who knew him in the old days says he got a nose job as soon as he had the money. He was very dapper, very concerned with his appearance, and very much wanted to be a successful, non-ethnic... New York socialite. The reason why a good chunk of both Golden and Silver Age superheroes, especially the ones who are the pillars of their respective comic book companies and in-house story universes are white, is because some of the Jewish men who created them desired various proximities to whiteness, something they didn't necessarily have access to during the late 30s and early 40s. It's because they desired the looks, life, and privilege usually associated with the various degrees of whiteness that was repurposed with this rebranding of Americanization and were made to feel bad about not having it thanks to their ethnicity and culture that the characters they created served as their wish fulfillment avatars and were given everything about whiteness slash Americanization that they always wanted. So, when we look at the creator of Aquaman, Austrian-Jewish-American writer Mort Weisinger, under the same form of possible internalized racism that whiteness slash Americanization makes minorities feel about themselves in comparison to this picture-perfect white Americans that are constantly presented as the standard, we see that what it is he possibly covets from the spectrum of whiteness as is presented in not only America, but in other areas of Europe that I'll touch on later, is actually present in three out of four characters he co-created for DC Comics. Aquaman, Green Arrow, and Golden Age era speedster Johnny Quick, who was released a year after the Golden Age version of The Flash, Jay Garrett. And what is it that Aquaman, Green Arrow, and Johnny Quick all have in common? Blonde hair and blue eyes. As a black kid who developed both self-hatred and internalized racism growing up after experiencing social alienation from other black kids and actively sought white acceptance in late high school and early college as a result, Thank Ra, that part of my life is over, Jesus Christ. While I've never personally desired these rare recessive traits usually found and associated with certain European backgrounds, I can completely understand why others do. 
Even among other white folk back in the day, blonde hair and blue eyes had been the epitome of European and American beauty and handsomeness. And those who lacked them were always reminded of it. But we already have plenty of gals like you in the troupe. We're looking for something different today. More all-American, younger and blonde. Someone with X Factor. Nowadays, the desire to have either blonde hair, blue eyes, or both among white Americans is still something that's both consciously and subconsciously desired. Two out of the three most popular female comedy YouTubers of the past generation, My Drunk Kitchen's Hannah Hart and Grace Helbig, are both natural brunettes, but have made their careers on the internet, film, and television based on their blonde dyed hair. And if white Americans who don't possess these recessive traits tend to feel this way, imagine how ethnic minorities feel about not having them when it's constantly presented to us as what's desirable thanks to Anglo and Eurocentric beauty standards, both as citizens of this country and even outside of it. African-American author, the late great Toni Morrison, wrote an entire novel revolving around the physical and psychological trauma that we as black Americans can endure when we are constantly reminded of how we will always be considered ugly and inferior according to the rules of white Americanization. It's called The Bluest Eye. It takes place in 1941, the same year DC premiered Weisinger's Golden Age Aquaman, coincidentally, and follows a black girl in and out of the foster system named Pekula, who, thanks to her being black, living in a mostly white town, sees her black skin as ugly and believes that everyone will start looking at her and conceiving her as beautiful if she had blue eyes. And while wanting blue eyes is her personal goal in attaining proximity to whiteness, the story also tells instances of both her mother and father's experience with being denied Americanization, thanks to both of them being black in both the physical and psychological journeys they both took from experiencing the subjugation that those who are allowed to claim whiteness can put people of color through. This resulted in them experiencing similar instances of self-hatred and inferiority in their personal searches for obtaining proximity to whiteness that, spoiler alert, failed just as tragically as Pekla's own. Now, I will say that if you intend to read this book, that there are very strong themes of, as you would expect, internalized racism and self-hatred, but... Because this book takes place in the 1940s, there are also strong color purple level depictions of exactly the type of abuse you're thinking it has. So read at your own discretion. And this is mostly a warning for my white readers watching this video who I'm only assuming never had her work as required reading until possibly college. I went to a predominantly black high school and Toni Morrison was on the required reading list for every one of my English classes from freshman to senior year. Nothing she's written surprises me at this point. <laughs> so whether it was having wealth and privilege, having a more pronounceable American name, or possessing characteristics that even proper white folks themselves coveted. The Jewish creators of the gold and silver age superheroes that we all know and love today all allowed the characters they created to live the lives with the mainstream and the traits that they themselves always wanted. Thanks to the envy generated by the hidden whiteness of Americanization. And with Mort Weisinger creating three characters that have blonde hair and blue eyes, it's a good guess what it was from mainstream America that he wanted. The thing about the characters created under these circumstances is that for a good majority of us who find justification in saying a character in comics can be interpreted as non-white if the whiteness they initially have isn't a pivotal part of their character, we don't even take into consideration the possibility that the majority of them were initially made white because their Jewish creators used them to live out their various fantasies involving being white. So when those of us who know how whiteness and its Americanization rebrand 
constantly fucks up the self-esteem and self-perception of people that can't have access to it and learn that most of these early comic characters from that time period are white because their minority creator had various degrees of said negative self-esteem and perception thanks to it. It kind of makes those of us who advocate for the reiterations want different reimaginings of the characters all the more. After all, if you were immense in a story with a certain character in it, and you knew they only looked the way that they did for no other reason than the creator wishing they had these features or privileges usually associated with the real life ethnic group that society constantly favored over yours or that the creator of the character, you kind of start wanting better for the character. And the reason why you start wanting better for the character is because as you've experienced minorities in your life try and come within proximity to whiteness in any shape or form, just to know what it feels like, regardless if they eventually get lost in their search, you start wanting better for the individual doing the searching. The thing about Aquaman, however, is that as time went on, either comic book writers or DC Comics as a whole began to realize this about his character. That he had the combination of him being a product of more Weisinger wanting proximity to whiteness in the form of the character's rare recessive facial features according to human standards and being white for no other reason than just to be white. So when time allowed, in order to address both of these aspects, they, within the parameters of the DC Universe, tried to justify his whiteness. And the result was them doing more harm to the character than good. Here's a few things you need to know about Arthur Curry's metamorphosis before I get into the meat of what I want to focus on in this segment. During the golden age of comics, the character of Aquaman created by Mort Weisinger was not the Arthur Curry version that we know of today. He was completely human, not full Atlantean or even half Atlantean, whose marine biologist father discovered the lost city of Atlantis. After making a home for the two of them, his father taught him the ways of the Atlanteans after studying their methods of ancient technology so that he lives and thrives under the sea. This translates to being able to breathe underwater for up to an hour, and as the Justice League movie likes a joke, talk to fish, as long as they were within 20 yards of him. The one constant that stayed with many of his comic iterations, however, was his blonde hair and blue eyes. It wasn't until the Silver Age of Comics arrived, spanning from 1956 to 1970, that we got a lot of the versions of the DC superheroes that are household names. From Hal Jordan's sci-fi based Green Lantern replacing Alan Scott, to Barry Allen's Flash replacing that of Jay Garrick. This version of Aquaman, conceived by writer Robert Bernstein, is now the half-Atlantean Arthur Curry character that a lot of us are familiar with the son of lighthouse keeper Tom Curry and an Atlantean named Atlana. She would become Queen Atlana until the modern age of comics. Just like this iteration brought the name Arthur Curry to the table, so did his abilities. To separate him from the Golden Age counterpart, Arthur can breathe underwater just as easily as he could breathe air without needing to come up for it every hour. And instead of speaking to sea creatures in their own languages, Arthur could telepathically communicate with them. The only thing added was that he needed to come in contact with water at least once per hour or he'd die, as a way of giving him a weakness similar to Superman's kryptonite, Hal's vulnerability to the color yellow, or, you know. This version of Aquaman, still white presenting in the skin department along with having blonde hair and blue eyes, would survive the transition between the Silver Age to the Bronze Age, with his main point of conflict being that, thanks to him being half human and half Atlantean, he was of two worlds. Keep that in mind, we'll be circling back to that point later on in the video. 
It wasn't until DC's first reboot event, Crisis on Infinite Earths, taking place between 1985 and 1986, that Aquaman's character would be once again modified upon the event, marking the end of the Bronze Age of comics and the beginning of the Modern Age. The retelling of his origin this time was assigned to the late Keith Giffen, who co-created Guardians of the Galaxy's Rocket Raccoon in 1976 for Marvel, Lobo for DC in 1983, and most recently, Jaime Reyes, the third Blue Beetle for DC in 2006. However, as others have gone on record to confirm, Giffen, like my arch nemesis David Shitback Goyer, was a great idea generator but a horrible storyteller. Comics he's written where he's only plotted for them were usually significantly better than the ones he both plotted and scripted for. This is why he frequently collaborated with Robert Lauren Fleming, with the Aquaman one-shot The Legend of Aquaman and the five-issue miniseries that followed it being no different. The changes made to his origin from his Silver Age counterpart were noticeable, but allowed enough leniency for a good chunk of the stories that were told during the previous age to still have happened in the new canon, with a few adjustments. Instead of being half Atlantean, he was made full Atlantean and abandoned as a baby. He wasn't born Arthur Curry, but took the name from the human that raised him after being murdered by Atlanteans searching for him. The reason why he was abandoned as a baby and that certain Atlanteans wanted him dead? Because he was born with white skin and blonde hair. According to Fleming's writing, in Atlantis, he would have been raised to think of himself as a freak. His skin, pale as the alabaster on a conch shell, would have made him a target of ridicule and derision. His blonde curls, trickling down his forehead in rivulets of gold, would have been shaven off and buried. And while there are plenty of instances in The Legend of Aquaman one-shot that delivered on the promise of some Atlanteans looking at Aquaman as a freak because of these prejudices, it's hard to understand exactly why these aspects about him were frowned upon by the people of Atlantis. And that's mostly because neither Keith Giffen or Robert Loring Fleming explained in either the one shot or the five issue miniseries why his gold hair and the supposed paleness of his skin ostracized him to other Atlanteans. That responsibility fell to Jewish creator Peter David, who, through his two miniseries, The Atlantis Chronicles and Aquaman Time and Tide, filled in a lot of the gaps that Giffen and Fleming left open when they initially remade Aquaman's origin for DC's modern era. Yes, they explained his mother was Atlanta, Queen of Atlantis, but it was David who stated that his Atlantean father was the Atlantean mage Atlan, and that his birth name is Orin. And while they never explained why blonde hair was ostracized in Atlantis, it was David who did by creating the Atlantean villain Kordax, a child of forced incest and abandoned at birth because of his green scales. Probably from said incest. When he became an adult after his blonde haired white human looking Atlantean father found and raised him, Kordax started a very bloody war with the merfolk of Tritonus, also commonly depicted with white skin tones, and the Atlanteans in the capital of Poseidonus. When he was beaten, he had his left hand severed and was banished from Atlantis as punishment. But by that time, Kordax had already become the Atlantean equivalent of the Boogeyman. And because he also had blonde hair like his father, a superstition formed where Atlanteans that were born with blonde hair were said to be a bad omen, carrying with them the curse of Kordax. And because he was born with blonde hair, this was why Orin, who would later take up the name Arthur Curry, was swept away after Queen Atlana gave birth to him unknown to her and left abandoned on Mercy Reef. Now, as a comic book fan, seeing one writer do something without further expanding on it only for 
another writer to take over and properly do the expanding is something that I'm kind of used to. So when I learned that Giffen and Fleming just planted the seed of the taboo and left the growth and care to it to whoever came after them that thought it needed said growth and care made me go, yeah, that tracks. Especially when the origin story of the first Atlantean to hold the title of his first established sidekick, Aqualad Garth, was given a similar backstory in the modern era by queer comic artist and writer Phil Jimenez. I promise this will be quick. Before his birth, Garth's uncle Zath was banished from the Atlantean state of the Hidden Valley for trying to pull a scar against his father and mother, King Thar and Queen Bera. Using forbidden magic and necromancy, Zath became Slizath and came back to the Hidden Valley to invade and make it a land of the dead. Slizath was able to be contained in an alternate dimensional prison thanks to a spell Thar performed before he died, but the result of said spell would give his offspring the magic necessary to undo Slithas prison, and one of the indicators of said offspring had the magic necessary to do so was having purple eyes. So, when a pregnant Queen Bera was banished back to the capital of Atlantis after Slithas' army succeeded in claiming the Hidden Valley, and she gave birth to Garth, guess what he was born with? And, more importantly, guess what they did with him as a result? <laughs> now, keep in mind, this modern era retelling of Garth's origin story was told November of 1996 to February of 1997 in flashbacks during a four issue miniseries explaining Garth pulling a Dick Grayson and transitioning from Aqualad to Tempest while having to deal with Slizath trying to siphon Garth's power to free himself. So by this time, Fleming's words in the epilogue of The Legend of Aquaman 1989 one-shot, where he said that Aquaman's relationship with him was, and I quote, a partial repayment for the kindness he'd been shown by the crusty old lighthouse keeper, were used as a base to expand on why Aquaman would want to pay it forward with Garth, while giving Garth similarities to Aquaman's origins regarding why he was abandoned by his people being what solidified it. However, once I learned about Garth's modern age origin and how it related to both the one given to Aquaman by Giffen and Fleming and how Peter David enhanced it, I found myself channeling Dr. Doofensmirch in regards to the in-universe actions of the Atlanteans. If I had a nickel for every time members of Atlantean society abandon their own as children because the rare resistive traits associated with either their hair or their eyes they were born with were linked to superstition and let them to die, then I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. But even when we go back to the one shot in question and read the bit explaining that Aquaman would have also been ridiculed for how pale his skin was, even that brought me a bit of pause as I read Giffen and Fleming's one shot and the miniseries that followed it. Because with this one shot being written and published in the late 80s, despite Marvel beating out DC and introducing mainstream black heroes and villains into their universe by a decade, Aquaman's nemesis Black Manta wasn't revealed to be actually black until 1977 after all. Atlanteans as a fantasy race within the DC Universe's lexicon, until recently, were always presented as white humans. Did they have various eye and hair colors? Yes, they did. You know, other than blonde hair and purple eyes because that, that's too crazy. But they were always depicted as aquatic white people. It was clear that Giffen and Fleming's intention was to say that the at the time white based Atlantean race of the late 80s and early 90s constantly dealt with colorism and that baby Aquaman would grow up to be a clear victim of it. 
this is definitely an issue among us human minorities who know that you have a better chance of experiencing whiteness via Americanization the lighter that your skin is. But this doesn't necessarily play out the same way when it comes specifically to white people. While white people do experience colorism, it's never on the same lines of experiencing prejudice among their own. It doesn't work on the same spectrum as how sexism between white men and women operates on the same level as sexism between black men and women, for example. Instead, it's in how the lot of them, both consciously and subconsciously, even among liberals, especially among liberals, gatekeep who among said minorities are allowed to enter the proximity of whiteness according to how light their skin is. Not only are there no Atlanteans of color present in this modern age era that Giffen and Fleming created to justify Atlantean colorism working in this way, but it doesn't even work the way they intended it in regards to him just being looked at by other Atlanteans as blatantly different than how they look. Because when you look at Aquaman himself as a baby, a young adult, and a full grown adult, in comparison to the other Atlanteans in both the one shot and the five issue miniseries, even the humans real talk, there's nothing pale as the alabaster of a conch shell about his skin. It would be different if this version of Aquaman was as pale as WWE Sheamus, more on that in a bit, but he is consistently lined shaded and colored to look exactly the same as every other Atlantean that we see. So colorism where exactly? Well, there is an explanation for that, but it would happen years later within the modern era of DC Comics. And it specifically involves the reworking and retconning of lore associated with Aquaman's main love interest, Queen Mera. Queen Mera, as depicted in the Silver and Bronze Age of Comics, was originally the queen of the Kingdom of Zebel, from an alternate dimension called Dimension Aqua. She and Aquaman fall in love, she gives up her claim to the throne of Dimension Aqua to wed Aquaman and become the Queen of Atlantis, and they both suffer the hardship of losing their newborn son at the hands of Black Manta. By the time Giffen and Fleming rework Aquaman's origin for the modern age, all of this is implied to have happened within the time that's covered in the one shot, including the death of Aquababy, once Arthur Jr., now Arthur III. However, before the New 52 reboot of the entire DC Universe, Mera's origins were redone during the DCU's universe-wide Brightest Day storyline between 2009 and 2010. Instead of Zebel being a kingdom from Dimension Aqua that Atlantis had no affiliation with or even knew existed, that Mira once ruled as queen, she's now the eldest princess of Zebel, a kingdom formed of Atlanteans that seceded from Atlantis after its initial fall and were banished to Dimension Aqua, now the Atlantean equivalent of Krypton's Phantom Zone. After years of being in a different dimension that's similar, yet different than Atlantis, Zebellians developed abilities that are both similar, yet different than that of main world Atlanteans. This is why she has hydrokinesis and other main world Atlanteans do not. However, it wasn't until this bit of Mira's backstory was retconned and better fleshed out that writers use this opportunity to finally introduce something that the Kingdom of Atlantis had been missing since its conception in the Silver Age. Introduce melanated sea dwellers. And we start seeing them in droves in the comics once this retcon version of both Zebel and Dimension Aqua enters the fray. Jackson Hyde, the second Aqua Lad, and the comic book equivalent of Young Justice Calder, is the son of African American human Black Manta and Zebellion Lucia Lokua, who has a skin tone, hair texture, and facial features similar to that of humans with African ancestry. Even after the New 52 and DC Rebirth, new Zebellions of color were being introduced, such as the Zebellion Hawea, Jackson Hyde's boyfriend, who has a skin tone and facial features similar to that of Polynesians and Pacific Islanders. 
Avengers. And Mera herself, as well as other members of the Zebel royal family that were part of the original Atlantean Rebellion, shared features similar to the joke that I made about Seamus earlier. Red hair and, to quote Fleming directly from the Legend of Aquaman one shot, skin, pale as the alabaster of a conch shell. So you remember what I said about how one of the ethnic groups that weren't initially allowed to have proximity to whiteness in America were the Irish? It may have taken 21 years since Aquaman's modern age revitalization, but we finally see the inclusion of Atlanteans that resemble real world ethnic groups other than those that fit the bill of Anglos and Europeans, finally making the claim Giffen and Fleming made that Atlanteans suffer from aspects of colorism more prominent. Because thanks to the lack of melanin among the citizens that make up the Kingdom of Atlantis from 1989 to 2011, it's implied that along with the Atlanteans with pale skin and red hair that didn't agree with how the kingdom was being handled when and after it sank, every black and brown skinned Atlantean was also banished to the Mention Aqua to help form the kingdom of Zebel. So now you can start to see where the problem is regarding how Atlantis and its ruling nation has been portrayed in comics for some 20 odd years. Thanks to the lack of information given to us by Giffen and Fleming when they initially had the opportunity to flesh things out, those who came after them to expand on their words did so by saying that those who fully claim underwater whiteness banish the underwater Irish and the underwater PLC to underwater interdimensional Australia. And now that the kingdom just consists of those who can fully claim underwater whiteness due to segregation, keeping them from being exposed to anyone different than them for centuries, enough centuries to forget that underwater interdimensional Australia even exists, said underwater white people are now used to being insulated from any type of discomfort that may come from experiencing underwater people that may look different than them. However, when those who do look different than them are born among them, the underwater white people lack the emotional intelligence necessary to actually handle the situation in a non-fragile way because of how long that they've been coddling each other. So they used superstition and prophecy, regardless if there is even a roof of truth to it, as an excuse to excommunicate said individuals from their underwater white society so that they don't have to deal with the guilt. Take out every use of the word underwater, and I just basically explained to you how white fragility works. <laughs> the absolute irony here is that the changes Giffen and Fleming made to Aquaman's origins that resulted in all of these changes to DC's Atlantean lore over the course of 20 years was all to help establish an in-universe reason for the very validation of Aquaman's whiteness. <laughs> they didn't think that his skin had to be paler than a traditional Anglo-American or European when Giffen wrote that bit about him possibly growing up with ridicule. They just wanted to explain that he was white by American standards as indicated by the artwork. They weren't thinking that a curse would be associated with how Atlanteans would look at people with blonde hair. They just wanted to establish a reason why he was blonde in the first place. But because these were the routes Giffen and Fleming went to try and explain the whiteness of this modern age era of Aquaman, it delivered a form of prejudice among Atlanteans that never really sat right with the specific demographic of its fan base. Most specifically because thanks to the way whiteness and colorism exist in real life, people of color 
who know the way white people project prejudice and systemic racism onto other ethnic minorities is damn near impossible when they try to do it on themselves, simply because of how whiteness works. This is why Giffen and Fleming's attempts at explaining why Arthur slash Orrin had to be white in the modern age era felt hollow and needed their work fleshed out by the hands of Peter David and their collaboration of Peter J. Tomasi and Jeff. I told Ray Fisher he'd never work in this town again if he didn't let Joss Whedon be racist to him during the set of the Justice League reshoots Johns. However, at the same time, a good chunk of its white fan base that already bought into the lie of white victimhood absolutely ate this half cocked reasoning for Arthur slash Orrin up. Because it featured an Atlantis that completely consisted of Atlanteans whose skin, hair, and eyes resembled Anglo-Americans and Europeans of the same skin tone, the privilege that they had falling under the criteria of whiteness never caused them to question these motives and reasonings the same way. They simply saw Arthur slash Orrin being ostracized by having blonde hair among other fellow white passing Atlanteans and went, see, racism and discrimination happens to us too. They were empowered by a fictional depiction of fictional discrimination because that one MTV special starring Jane Elliott showing how delicate white fragility is to a whole new generation of white people left them stressed the fuck out. Then, as time passed, comic creators realized how homogenized DC's Atlantis was and that more diversity was needed even before the New 52 reboot of the DC Universe. The inevitability of Giffen and Fleming's words being fleshed out finally happened due to how little was done to try and explain things in the first place. The superstitions justifying the Atlanteans' prejudice over Orin and Garth were established. Zebel was reconstructed to allow Atlanteans of color into the mainstream DC universe. And, as you can imagine, those white fans that held on to their precious all-white underwater kingdom were furious. They were either mad that black and brown Atlanteans now existed, invalidating every black and brown Zebelian that was introduced because the restructuring of Dimension Aqua and Zebel counted as a retcon and comic book fans hate retcons, or accused DC of putting politics in their comics about an underwater kingdom. Once they figured out that all the black, brown, and Irish Atlanteans were banished, by the white ones, according to the new lore. Either way, both arguments are being used as fuel for comic gators to this day. The changes to the early days of modern era Aquaman stories that allowed inclusion and properly pr critiqued the concept of whiteness were seen by those who were only fans of this modern era iteration of Atlantis because they worshiped whiteness as nothing else but a threat. Because when white Americans see minorities succeed, it threatens them in a way that makes them feel like victims. And despite it being absolutely refreshing, both in regards to the lore and the very character, nothing in the DC Extended Universe delivered that blow of white victimhood the most than with Jason Momoa's casting of Arthur Curry and James Wan's first Aquaman film. When DC released the New 52, their first reboot of their mainstream comic book universe since the Crisis of Infinite Earths event in the 1980s, everything was given the chance to be revitalized. This included the origin stories for heroes and villains, and even lore revolving around locations and past events. So you would think that this would be something that the lore surrounding both Aquaman and Atlantis would hugely benefit from, right? Well, yes and no. Regarding what all changed and what all say the same, all I'll say on the matter is that I tried to do a brief breakdown of what all the New 52 slash DC Rebirth added, subtracted, and adjusted three separate times in this script, and every time that I did, I didn't even get halfway done before I completely exhausted myself and tried to start over. So for those of you who, who want to try and tackle that football player on your own, 
I wish you all the luck in the world. Actually, matter of fact, let me know in the comments if you actually know the differences between the modern age Atlantis and New 52 slash DC, DC Rebirth Atlantis. I need to know if you've succeeded where I have failed. <laughs> For the sake of this section of this video, however, what you need to know is that when it got time to introduce Atlantis to the DC Extended Universe, first through Justice League cuts and then through James Wan's Aquaman, a lot of things involving both the nation and Aquaman himself, Arthur Curry, were simplified in comparison to its comic book counterparts, despite most of the source's material being used from the New 52. When Atlantis fell, the nation split into seven separate kingdoms, whose people evolved to develop their own individual powers and abilities outside of being able to breathe underwater. Six out of seven of these kingdoms that were introduced in the first Aquaman movie are Atlantis, Zebel, the Kingdom of the Deserters who died out when their ocean evaporated and became the Sahara Desert, the Kingdom of the Fishermen, who are basically merfolk, the Trench, and the Brine. Seven kingdoms to represent the seven seas. Instead of white Atlanteans banishing Iris Atlanteans and Atlanteans of color to underwater interdimensional Australia, a good chunk of the surviving population of Atlanteans simply left Atlantis after its stank to start the kingdom of Zebel on their own. And now that there isn't a Dimension Aqua for the Zebelian royal family to develop their hydrokinesis through years of exposure and evolution, Mera's movie version was taught a magic variant of it by Queen Atlanta when she stayed in Atlantis as her protege, thanks to her parents, King Nereus, and his wife participating in a Zebelian war against an opponent unaffiliated with the Seven Kingdoms before the events of Aquaman's solo film. So basically, we're off to a good start. By making Zebel just an underwater kingdom that formed because they didn't vibe with the now King Atlan sinking their entire civilization when he tested out his trident, we have eliminated Giffen and Fleming's lackluster reasoning for why Aquaman had to be white with blonde hair and blue eyes that did nothing but leave it to other creators to explain why prejudice, colorism, and segregation existed among Atlanteans in modern age comic books. In the DCEU, Atlanteans of multiple skin tones exist in both of the underwater kingdoms whose population properly reflects that of humans and always have. However, that doesn't mean a sociological flaw among the sentient humanoid population of the Seven Kingdoms no longer exists. Because while the changes made to simplify the DCEU variant of Atlantis have done away with the likes of prejudice, colorism, and segregation among their fellow Atlanteans, the movie instead unites the majority of the underwater populace under that of xenophobia. In this case, it's xenophobia against the humans of the surface world, thanks to the damage that we have been doing to the oceans and its wildlife due to pollution and oil spills thanks to the like of capitalism. So what makes this route that the DCEU takes Atlantis in better than what it's done in the modern age of comics? Well, we have to remember that the main factor regarding why modern age Aero Aquaman and Atlantis turned out the way that it did is because Giffen and Fleming attempted to add validation to why Aquaman should be white with the blonde hair and blue eyes initially given to him by Mort Weisinger, rare traits that whiteness slash Americanization have weaponized to make those who can't have proximity to whiteness feel inferior about themselves and remind those who do have proximity to it that they will never have it fully. It's in their attempt to justify Aquaman having these traits in universe that caused Atlantis as a whole to both be perceived as and evolve into a nation that specializes in segregation and fragility, whether it was Giffen and Fleming's intention or not. And as a result of these actions and decisions, the justification of white victimhood and fragility was established with it that only started to be addressed when actions were first made to properly diversify things. 
The reaction received when black and brown Atlanteans were introduced into the DC universe pre-New 52 from its white fan base said everything that needed to be said about how Aquaman and Atlantis had been perceived for the past 20 years and a fresh start to be more inclusive from the very beginning was warranted by the time Atlantis was reworked for both the New 52 and the DC Extended Universe. Now, this isn't to say that how white comic skaters attach themselves to the modern age era Aquaman stories is any different than how other groups of people attach themselves to stories. After all, Lindsay Ellis said it best, humans have a natural in-group, out-group mentality and we've divvied ourselves into lots and lots of groups, so cultural and racial coding sneaks into stories, intentional or not. But when one of the groups that attaches itself to a story is in blatant support of white supremacy because of how easily said story caters to their cultural coding, it says a lot. Especially when media literacy is willingly ignored by said groups who bring their cultural coding to a story where the creative working on it is trying to show why said coding is wrong in the first place. The DCEU shifting the flaw of Atlanteans to that of xenophobia opens things up for way more coding imprint into a story than how the modern age of Aquaman comics initially aimed for, both cultural and racial. Not only are the reasons why Atlanteans and other sentient sea dwellers dislike humans absolutely valid, but they can also grow to be toxic and dangerous in ways that can grow malevolent, that I will gladly explain later. And thanks to the adjustments made to the main character, this hurdle can be something that can be seen as incredibly relatable in ways that his original blonde haired blue eyed self wouldn't have even succeeded at. You see, one of the things that was changed about Aquaman in both the New 52 and in the DC Extended Universe is that he now better reflects his Silver Age origin of being Arthur Curry, the half-human Atlantean son of Tom Curry and Queen Alana. No longer does he have a curse associated with him that, thanks to being born with blonde hair, caused him to be ostracized by his fellow Atlanteans. Instead, they look at him differently because he's Queen Atlanta's bastard half-breed son. This not only brings a bit of humanity back to Aquaman, but seeing him be exposed to this form of ostracization as opposed to what his modern age version went through becomes incredibly more relatable for individuals who, like Arthur, feel like they're born of two worlds and don't belong in either because of how both perceive them. Instead of his blonde hair displaying that he possibly has ancestral connections with one of the most genocidal villains of the Atlantean history, a good chunk of Atlantis won't accept him because he's half human. This is more practical and still highlights the flaws of Atlantean society without allowing those who stand for white supremacy and victimhood to attach themselves to it. But the best way the DC Extended Universe helped get this point across when it comes to Arthur, however, is Zack Snyder casting Jason Momoa and both he and James Wan incorporating his Hawaiian ancestry into the character, both through his father Tom and in the character's very culture and heritage. <laughs> This is what a lot of us mean when we say a character can be depicted as non-white if the traditional whiteness they're usually associated with isn't an absolute necessity for their character to be accurately depicted. In the case of the Aquaman of the Silver Age of Comics, the New 52, and the DC Extended Universe, Arthur Curry's developmental accuracy isn't in his Americanized whiteness, but in his lineage hybridization of being human and Atlantean, dealing with finding acceptance of the surface world, the underwater world, those that matter the most to him, and most importantly, himself. Not only does Arthur struggle hit close to home with real life people who deal with a form of seeking this type of acceptance from friends, family, and society on a racial and ethnic level, 
But Arthur's metaphor is then enhanced and given even more relatability when he's portrayed by someone who visibly expresses said hybridization applied to real life standards. Such as a melanated, half white, half Hawaiian man that is incredibly proud of his Hawaiian heritage and culture, but like Zack Snyder's initial pitch to Momoa for Justice League, felt like an outsider because of who he is. I was born in Hawaii and raised in Iowa, Jason said in that same interview with SAMDB News from earlier, so I could definitely identify with that. I also like that Arthur is a half-breed, half Atlantean and half human, and was really interested in the idea of him being this brown-skinned superhero who is part of two worlds but doesn't belong to either one. I think that's pretty special. Going this route provides a sense of depth and interpersonal connection to Arthur Curry that his blonde haired, blue eyed, white depiction could never properly carry over in the same message behind it. So much so that the modern age era Aquaman had to be reinvented with his own loosely defined perils regarding Atlantean society in order to justify why his white skin and blonde hair had to stay intact. And it was so loosely done that when other writers actually went to define the perils, they were pretty much forced to highlight just how much Atlanteans suffered from the concept of white fragility over the course of their existence. This would be no problem if that was the initial intention of either Giffen and Fleming, Peter David, or Jeff Johns. After all, there is a socio-political reason why out of all the nations in Avatar The Last Airbender and the Asian cultures that inspired them, the Fire Nation is heavily influenced by the Japanese. You know what you did. But that was done intentionally. The socio-political questioning of Atlantean society with everything that was introduced to fill the gaps of Atlantean prejudice and superstitions were subconsciously formed well after either the addition or the retcon of certain lore and said questioning was never on the ones who filled in said gaps in the first place. They just said X, Y, and Z is why A, B, and C exist and left us to read it and go, so if X, Y, and Z is the reason why A, B, and C exist, then is that the reason why there's so much 1, 2, and 3 here? Because there is a lot of 1, 2, and 3 here. Now, while I'm absolutely sure that part of Zack Snyder's reasoning involved being a fan of Peter David's rugged hook for a hand depiction, it's obvious through these reasons alone that Jason Momoa's casting did so much more for Arthur Curry's character than a lot of people realize, both in regards to representation and in regards to portraying a more palpable adversity that previously portrayed in the comics. But in doing so, it also meant giving another Atlantean character close to Aquaman a bit of an overhaul as well. Orm the Ocean Master is Aquaman's half-brother and one of the top arch nemesis among his rogues gallery, with Black Manta being number one. He was initially the full human younger half-brother of Arthur in the Silver Age of comics. He had amnesia and didn't know Arthur was his brother whenever they fought. But the version that's most common to most people is him being Arthur's full Atlantean younger half-brother by having Queen Alana as his mother, that they each have to defeat in order to claim the throne of Atlantis for themselves. Now, usually, Orm, as a full-blooded Atlantean, is usually depicted with white passing skin, black hair, and brown to black eyes. But in the DC Extended Universe, in which he's betrayed by James Wan's go-to male actor Patrick Wilson, Orm has natural blonde hair and blue eyes, physical traits that, before Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice expanded the DCEU, were usually associated with Aquaman. This was done on purpose. 
Now, James Wan has gone on record saying that part of the reason why he made Orm resemble what Aquaman traditionally looks like in the comics for the film was because he thought it would be a cool contrast from what Jason Momoa looks like, and he's not wrong. However, while he never says it outright, there was always part of me that saw Orm's actions in the movie while looking the way that he does in the movie and wondered if there was another reason for why James Wan gave Orn these characteristics that are usually associated with Aquaman. One that, if you've learned your history, obviously becomes less than subtle. As I stated before, and as history classes have, I hopefully assume correctly, taught in abundance of you, there are other worldly associations with white individuals having blonde hair and blue eyes than it just being used to represent winning the genetic jackpot of Americanized whiteness in regards to traits and facial features. The most popular one goes all the way back to Nazi Germany. Now, some of you already know where I'm going with this, and some already know how it connects to Aquaman 2018, but me making this point was honestly the main reason why I always wanted to make this video in the first place, so please, just, just bear with me for a second longer. <laughs> You see, to help justify his genocide of the Jewish people and feed his obsession with racial purity, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party established that Germany was capable of creating a superior race of man that he labeled the Aryan race, or the master race if you're a gamer. They will be described as being white, with blonde hair and blue eyes, with pure blood and a God-given duty to rule the world. They'd be superior in comparison to every other race of humans on the planet, above the Jewish people that he persecuted, the Romani people that have been stereotyped to oblivion, and even us black folk who rightfully so kicked the asses of his SeanCody.com looking ass athletes at the 1936 Olympic Games. Wishful thinking would be that this way of thinking died out after Hitler unalived himself and the Nazi party surrendered at the end of World War II, but you'd be completely unsurprised to hear that this train of thought is still alive and well. And from skinheads to the neo-Nazis to the Proud Boys to the various police departments across the country, it's even helped strengthen both the prejudices and systemic racism already established here in the United States thanks to the Americanized rebrand of whiteness. Meanwhile, Orm, as depicted by Patrick Wilson in 2018's Aquaman, is pretty much this in Atlantean form. Like that of the Aryan identity, the sense of superiority Orm has as a pure, royal-blooded Atlantean tells him that he alone can rule the world. As Ocean Master, you'll be commander of the greatest military might on this planet. I am the natural choice to lead it. This same superiority causes him to look at the other surviving nations of the Seven Kingdoms as lesser all while using both backhanded alliances with humans and outright committing war crimes in order for them to bend the knee. Uh, Finn in one instance. And while his xenophobic hatred for humans is obvious, there's how he views his older brother Arthur. Shame the fact that I have a half-breed brother whose heart I wanted to run my trident through. Not just in seeing him as the scapegoat for Queen Atlanta's excommunication from Atlantis. You were the reason our mother was executed. And I've hated you for it ever since. But also as nothing but a bastard whose half-human lineage marks him as impure and inferior to his own. That trident doesn't change what you are. Faster. And while both director James Wan and Patrick Wilson himself have gone on record to give other, more non-controversial reasonings for the visual changes to the character as opposed to how he's initially shown in the comics, one can't help but see how Ocean Master is handled in this movie and wonder if this cocktail of superiority, coming into power in unethical ways 
and both racial cleansing and world conquest being depicted in his character as genuinely reflecting the initial intention of Hitler's Aryan race as the real reason why they gave DCEU Orm blonde hair and blue eyes. This is why DCEU Orm gaining the physical traits that are usually associated with Aquaman is a great example of said migration proving to be a better representation for the character in question. For one, the use of blonde hair and blue eyes over the years when it comes to the North American oppression that is whiteness is just as prominent today as it was when Aquaman was created in the 1940s and earlier. While individuals may vary, the two, both separate and together, are still some of the most popular hair and eye colors across both the United States and Europe, according to multiple surveys. And that's partially due to how whiteness allowed these two rare recessive traits to be seen and coveted by those who both could and couldn't claim it as the concept's golden standard. Pun unintended. Also, Thanks to this standard, we've seen through the likes of Hitler and his Aryan race pet project where it can go because of how high of a pedestal that the concept of whiteness placed it on. It can be, has been, is currently, and will be used as a mascot for the likes of superiority, supremacy, oppression, hatred, and privilege. Some born with these features have tried to fight the allegations with their time and allyship by supporting those that are being oppressed by the regime that their traits are the mascot for in any way that they can. Most of the time, they realize that using their privilege to the benefit of said oppressed people is the most effective. Meanwhile, you have those born with those features that don't care about its reputation and care more about acquiring the top tier superiority and privilege that comes from winning said whiteness lottery while disregarding the daily oppression and inferiority done to those who don't have access to even bottom tier whiteness. So you know, basically PewDiePie. Now, because we have other all-white characters from DC Comics The Silver Age that have these rare recessive traits, heroes like Barry Allen's Flash, Oliver Queen's Green Arrow, and of course, Arthur Curry's Aquaman, we tend to not associate these negative truths about them with the superheroes who were created to have them. But when we learn that these Golden Age characters and a good deal of their updated Silver Age variants were created by Jewish men who wanted to be among those who could easily claim the concept of whiteness, yes, even Bob Conagher, the man who created Barry Allen, was a Romanian Jewish American, things start to click regarding seeing how much of a chokehold blonde hair and blue eyes has across the world. While it's perfectly possible for a character to have these traits and not associate with the real world history of oppression and privilege behind them, Orm as a character, both in the comics and in the DCEU, actually represents everything usually associated with the history attached to how blonde hair and blue eyes are successfully propagandized across the world. He is the person you see that society tells you that you should be like. But you can't because of his immediate access to privilege and your lack of. He is the one who believes that he and his fellow Atlanteans are superior in every way, both in comparison to the surface dwelling humans and even the non-humanoid races of the Seven Kingdoms. And he's willing to display said superiority by claiming dominion over the entire seven seas just to gain the power necessary to completely wipe out the human race. Just from this explanation and this explanation alone, a non-comic book fan would look at both Orm and Aquaman, see their facial features, and go, the blonde hair and blue eyes are on the wrong character.
If the casting of biracial actor Jason Momoa as Aquaman helped enhance the two worlds allegory in ways that casting an actor closer to how he's depicted in the comics could never convey, then taking those features usually associated with Aquaman and adding them to how Ocean Master is portrayed by Patrick Wilson in the DCEU enhances his allegory as well. Orm, both in the DCEU and in the current iteration of Aquaman comics, not only represents everything that Hitler projected onto the Aryan race, but also the alienation and the privilege others feel when they see where they rank in Americanized whiteness. As a result, giving Orm Aquaman's blonde hair and blue eyes instead of his traditional black operates more like a real-world history easter egg than a creative choice. It's because of these real world equivalents made by Orm over the course of the movie, the impurity of his brother's human lineage, the opinions of humans in general, and even how he views every non-humanoid sea dweller across the Seven Kingdoms, that both the whiteness and his portrayal and decisions to give him said facial features succeeds in the justification in ways that Giffen and Fleming's attempt with Aquaman in the modern age of era of comics fail at. When you look at Orm, the Ocean Master in Aquaman 2018, you see the Atlantean equivalent of white supremacy. And because his xenophobic opinions about humans and the superiority of Atlanteans has existed in his character since he became Arthur's nemesis who constantly contended for the throne in the Silver Age, saying that this aspect about him in the movie is an out of character depiction is a fucking lie. A war is coming to the surface whether you like it or not. And I'm bringing the wrath of the seven seas with me. The release of 2023's Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom will not only mark the end of the DC Extended Universe, but also make it the last time Jason Momoa will possibly ever play the role of Arthur Curry. While James Gunn has hinted that the next time we see Jason in the rebooted DC Universe he'll be Lobo, his DC Studios partner Peter Safran has pretty much confirmed that this will be his last deep dive going on record to say that Momoa will always have a home at DC even if he's no longer playing the King of Atlantis. My biggest fear with this decision is that this might be a return to formula for the character when either his movie or HBO Max series set in Gunn's DC Universe is scheduled for production that, depending on the writer and director hired by Gunn and Saffron to bring the character to life in this new universe, the urge to put the character back in his white skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes for the sake of comic accuracy and whatnot may beat the storytelling possibilities that have proven to be impactful with him just for not giving in to the inferiority complex that possibly caused Jewish creators to make these characters the pinnacle of Americanized whiteness. And I feel that because there is a good chance a lot of the major players in superhero comics and stories have been created under these pretenses, not just Aquaman, those who always benefited from the whiteness that these superheroes were molded in are very quick to claim them and say that nothing new should be done with them. No alternate universes, no reimaginings, no people of color playing them that can possibly pass, nothing. And when they try to justify why they have to stay white the same way that ethnicities of non-white characters successfully justify why their skin tone and culture shouldn't be allowed to fit a white actor, the homogenization of the cultures that have been traded in to join the melting pot of Americanized whiteness provides them with nothing solid enough to make the justification. So regardless if it was intentional or not, they have to make things up. They establish a new rule about the society the character comes from that explains why they have to look that way. But instead, 
it just allows people to start asking more and more questions about said fictional society as more time passes and the real world concept of whiteness is constantly critiqued and applied to the world of fiction because real people constantly imprint themselves and their experiences in stories all the time. And I'm pretty sure there was a certain black reader of Aquaman in the early 90s that went, where are all the black Atlanteans? And because those who made the change to justify the character's whiteness never thought to actually answer that question, others subconsciously did. And in doing so, it painted a bad look at the whole mythos that the character in question came from. Then years pass, and individuals that can see past the white claim of certain characters that were created from coveting American whiteness see that they can be portrayed by others that don't naturally reflect it. As a matter of fact, because of the upbringing of both the character and the individual playing them, it actually enhances the experience of the arc that the character actually goes through and properly reaches out to certain individuals who need a representative. The character that was once created because his creator always wanted the privilege and attention that came from having blonde hair and blue eyes now has a meaningful connection to his upbringing thanks to the person of color portraying him that shows others that this character can be played by an individual who isn't white. But at the same time, thanks to both American and world history, we see that it's less that the individuals in question couldn't come up with a proper justification regarding why the character had to be white, because there were justifications they could use. They just didn't want to use them. Because if they did so under the same principle that the concept of whiteness has had these characters ensnared in for the longest time, they would have to address a lot of things that they're not necessarily proud of. Things that involve their dabbling in superiority and privilege, but in revealing it, exposes their fragility. <laughs> you see, they had to make up in-universe reasoning for why Aquaman had to be white in the comics during the 90s. They couldn't use justifications that allowed individuals or a group of people to imprint themselves on his experience, at least not consciously. Because if they did, then he wouldn't be Aquaman anymore. He wouldn't be an outcast that was born of two worlds who belonged to neither that is properly reflected as such. Hell, he wouldn't even be left to die on Mercy Reef if that's the origin of the character you prefer. He'd be the Atlantean equivalent of racism and xenophobia and white supremacy, privilege, and fragility. He'd be Orm, the Ocean Master. And all that would be left to get the point across would be to give him blonde hair and blue eyes.